sure you'll need this. I don't need this. You're rendering this Premiere. You need this. Thanks, I guess. Boss, you sure you don't want this? I want this. <laughs> <laughs> so for this video here, I've gathered everything. I was wondering when I transitioned to DaVinci Resolve coming from Premiere Pro. And hopefully it will help you better transition as well, make it more simpler. A great thing about these older licenses is that the upgrades to the newer versions are free. So yes, I finally did the switch. In this video, I basically want to go over the basics and workflow, all the way from media import, cutting, coloring, some motion graphics stuff, and finally, export. I will also conclude some of the main effects I used to do in After Effects. A little bit of Fusion as well. In case you don't know what's Fusion, basically After Effects inside of DaVinci Resolve. But before we continue with the basics and the workflow, I just wanted to mention a couple of good things and perks that came with the Switch. So listen up. Firstly, I want to mention rendering times. I was completely blown away. Let me see check if I did anything wrong. For example, last season's winter movie was like 11 minutes and 45 seconds in length. Okay, so this season was wild. The Winter Resolve rendered it in just a little under 8 minutes. Like from Premiere taste it was something like a 5 minute video took like 20 to 30 minutes of render and if there is a fix you need to do after the render <laughs> it's a pretty sad situation <laughs> secondly i want to mention errors i've actually gotten none but what i will say it has crashed a couple of times and just shut down when i've been working on a bit of a complex project but with the autosave davinci resolve has i have been able to easily just continue from where i left off but the reason it is still better for me with only the crashes and the shutdowns if if you have used Premiere Pro a lot, you're probably not foreign to those unknown errors. Error compiling movie, unknown error, like where do we even continue on from here? And continuously you fall into this rabbit hole of trying multiple fixes, changing the position of a clip, changing the speed ramp to make it work, trying to copy everything into a new sequence, opening a copy in a new project to change the render. And one time I even remember that what worked for me was actually changing the output drive that I was exporting to. And thirdly, and let's just say lastly, because I also want to show you the workflow. Shortly put, after using it for a while, you really start to realize yourself that it is just more efficiently laid out and built out for you. And now we get started with the workflow. I wanted to mention that when you're first setting DaVinci Resolve up, it will also ask you about what other editing suit, keyboard layout you want to bring over. For that, I myself have chosen Premiere Pro. So just so you know, but eventually it doesn't matter from what editing suit you're coming over. You can always work out these little things with your specific layout. So let's go. So firstly, when opening DaVinci Resolve and being in a new project, right here you have seven workspaces which you can see here, down below. It follows the logical pipeline of importing the media, making your selects by cutting, editing the footage, then grading some motion graphics if needed, making color corrections and gradings, audio editing, and finally, exporting each in its own space and by changing the workspace ideally you'll be seeing where you came from in the preview window as well more on that later on in this video i'm going to skip the first two tabs because i usually start off immediately on the editing tab and make my imports and selects right there old habits die hard feel free to explore those specific workspaces yourself before we start to do anything with the clips each time in a new project we want to make sure that we are using the right color space settings so what you want to do is go to this gear icon over here 
Click the scare icon which opens up project settings. Next up going over to the color management tab. If you're on a Mac there is a gamma shift that happens. What that eventually means is that your export colors aren't the same that you saw in the preview window while you were editing. And here I'll show you one way that has worked for me. In DaVinci generally there's many ways to get around the same problem. So right here for Mac uh, you'll need to set color space to Rec 709A and use the same for output. For Windows, what I gathered from YouTube comments and Google, there shouldn't be any gamma shift, so you should be able to immediately use the gamma 2.4 option. And you can always test it out yourself with a render, it does look the same. From what I gathered, you'll just have to accept that there still will be some visual differences viewing these files between the two operating systems. And also what I want to mention here is, I'm moving down below, set this one here to tetrahedral. Whenever later you plan to use LUTs for coloring your footage, the LUT output should be more accurate. And immediately down below here, by clicking on it, you can see the location of your LUT folder and you can import your own LUTs. So click on save. And if you're on a Mac, there's one more thing that is advised to do. So over here, go to preferences, go to general tab and check the use Mac display color profiles for viewers and click on save. Also, I'm going to quickly go over where you can set a couple of my extra keyboard shortcuts that I use. The QWE for cutting clips a certain way and a full screen keyboard shortcut that I use to preview my edit in full screen. And now let us create a timeline. So over here in the top left corner, uh, you have media pool. Click on that if it's not expanded yet. How I do it is right click here, go to timelines and create new timeline. Here we can name the timeline. I'm gonna name it test. And now if we just quickly recall back the gear icon that we touched previously, the reason why you would want to set it up nicely is that later on you wouldn't have to set anything manually, that it basically is a master setting for your project. In this case, I can also show you if we untick the use project settings. By going to the color tab, you will see that timeline color space is Rec 709A already, as we put it. If we hadn't set it up first, this would be Rec 709C. Same goes for the middle tabs. So usually when I'm at this point, I only go to format, set my resolution here. This is also something you can immediately set in the project settings under the gear icon, but I usually only set the color. If I want vertical social media content, you can just tick that and you can just quickly get a vertical version. In this case, I don't want it. So I create a 4K timeline and I click create and immediately we are inside the timeline. What's important to note here is to gain back some Premiere Pro similarities. I also have to mention that if you're working with many different timelines, timeline two, if I double click on them to get into the timeline, you will see that on top of the timeline and playhead, there's no extra notation of the timeline names. Like in Premiere Pro, there were sequence names on top of the timeline. In order to do that, click on this icon over here, which is timeline view options, and click on this icon over here, which is stacked timelines. And now if you open another timeline, it's more familiar to Premiere Pro. You can switch between over here. For whatever reason in a bigger project, your stuff here gets lost already. And this is a nice way to just quickly navigate. In this media pool section, the folders are called bins. So here you can categorize your stuff and make subfolders or bins. Here we just simply click and drag our files over here. Following how it works in Premiere Pro, here you can double click on your clip, which basically opens up the source monitor where you can view your raw source clip. And as in Premiere, you should be able to make your specific select of the clip by setting in and out points for the clip by pressing I and O. And here in the source monitor, you can also choose if you want the video file or the audio file or both to be tracked onto the timeline. Other way is to just drag everything onto the timeline and with the help of our QWE keyboard shortcuts, start making selects. So if you dragged everything onto the timeline, by default you have the clip locked with the audio clip. Or for whatever reason, you need to sometimes move them around separately and mostly just being able to make L or J cuts. The way to disconnect the video layer and the audio clip is just by right clicking on it and checking off the link clips. To get it linked again, activate what you need to have linked and click link clips again. And if you're on the timeline and need to check some clips raw source clip again, just have the clip activated and click on F which opens up the source monitor again. And quickly going to mention if you want to disable some clip to be able to see the bottom layer of it, just click on your layer that you want to deactivate and just click D on your keyboard. This will at times also help you when you are switching uh, workspace tabs and you are expecting to see something that you have as a bottom layer in your timeline, let's say under an overlay. By switching the workspaces tabs, you will see the most top one. So before touching the fusion, you will see it mostly in the color tab. There's probably other ways around it, but that's how I do it to quickly see that stuff in other spaces.
Let's just first create a text clip to be able to discover some clip parameters. And here I can also quickly show you that this is where you can get also access to video transitions, all the way to audio stuff also. In this case, we want text, so we go under titles and we drag this one onto the timeline. And for the effects, you would just have your wanted clip selected on the timeline and just double click on the effect or drag it on. And for transition, you would just drag the transition in between your two clips to your wanted spot for the transition. And here you can already see one great thing of many in DaVinci Resolve that you can also see previews. So here under the inspector, I can actually demonstrate quite a lot already. Here are your clip settings. We have the position parameters, zoom parameters, and many other basic things that you would want to have. Here we also have dynamic zoom, which again shows this program's efficiency. And coming under our preview window of the video over here, here's an option to just interactively turn on some of that we saw under the inspector tab. So I'm gonna show you the example with uh, dynamic zoom. Dynamic zoom is basically a really quick way in DaVinci Resolve to get these linear zoom-ins or zoom-outs. It doesn't have to be linear. You can adjust the curve for that one also. So how it works is we click on dynamic zoom and right here in the preview window, you just track the starting point and ending point. And just to have some clarity in the preview window, when you're not wanting to see those lines anymore for dynamic zoom, you, you can just turn the view for it off right over here again. And if you just quickly want to reverse the direction of the zoom, just go again under the inspector tab where you just have more parameters for everything. And under the dynamic zoom, just click reverse. And here you can also choose the curve for it, how you want it to zoom in. As you can see, is in, is out. As this is an automatic keyframe manipulation, you may be wondering how to create manual keyframes. In Premiere Pro, it was mostly to do with the stopwatch icon. In this case for DaVinci Resolve, wherever you see these dots uh, for the parameters, by clicking on them, it's basically the same effect. We are creating a keyframe. In this case, let's just create a zoom in effect for our text. So I would immediately set the zoom at a scale that I want the text to be in when it pops up. And now by going back a couple of frames, I will put the zoom to zero. Now the way we set up those keyframes, through time it is a linear change and for such pop-outs and text zoom-ins it doesn't look really good. So by setting the points like these we are creating a linear change but we want to add some spice to it and we want to create something that's called the ease-in for the keyframes. Now if you use the left and right arrows on your keyboard, if we come to our actual keyframe that we have set, we'll know that we are at our keyframe that we have set by seeing this dot over here go red. Then we can right click on it and set this to ease in. And this in itself snowballs into a question that, that where you could see and modify the actual curve yourself for this parameter. So by going to the timeline and finding this curve icon over here and under it, you will see an arrow, which here you can see basically many options for which you can modify the time curve basically, or just immediately start doing those adjustments over here instead of the inspector. So over here we can create keyframes by being on this line, holding on Alt and clicking on it. And here we can move it around and by having the keyframe dot selected, here on top of it you can already see those presets for ease in and ease out that you can quickly apply. And there you can see that you get these handles for your keyframe. And here you can adjust by those handles how, how harsh you want the ease in to be or how quickly you want basically the ease in effect to appear and just play around with the curve, play it back and see what you like. Basically, you've already gotten the taste of how speed ramping also works in DaVinci Resolve. So now, instead of the zoom parameter, we want to modify something else. So go back to this arrow and for DaVinci Resolve, just look for read time speed. And the same way we added keyframe points before, also works the same for speed ramping. And quickly mentioning the speed ramping at a really beginner level. So here's also a quick simple formula for you where you have your timeline frame rate and your clips frame rate showing you basically how much percentage you can basically slow down so it still would be smooth and not uh, not choppy basically it wouldn't show it under your timeline's frame rate and speed ramping itself is quite often used for video transitions as well so just at the end of the clip you ramp it up a little make the clip go faster and in the next clip you make it from faster to back to normal but you gotta be quite careful with the speeds subtle use goes a long way next up we have composite which i mainly use for overlay so called blending mode for premiere pro and what's also great about it is by just simply going over these options you will immediately see the output in your preview window without having to select it even that's that's awesome <laughs> great efficiency right there <laughs> 
And down below we have stabilizer already basically connected to the clip and we don't have to look it up as an extra effect like we did in Premiere Pro. It's again one of those things in DaVinci Resolve where something is where it is supposed to be. <laughs> also a nice thing about it is when you're doing speed ramming to your clip, you can still apply this without nesting the clip or in DaVinci Resolve terms, right here the nested clip is called compound clip. Just whenever you're doing those adjustments to your clip, don't forget to restabilize your clip again because it can cause clip position glitching problems if you forget to. Retime and scaling. This is where you can create something called optical flow uh, for Premiere Pro. Create some magical interpolated frames in between your frames so you could fake extra slow motion. In this case, I just quickly mentioned it. Look it up yourself more specifically if you need to. And in case you need something on top of everything as an adjustment layer, what we had in Premiere Pro, in this program it is under effects and it is called adjustment clip. But in this case, I'm just quickly going to say ahead that this is the program where you don't need to do some conversion LUT and color grading this way. Don't do that. This will all be handled under the color tab uh, workspace without any adjustment clip or layer. Let's say you need to use the zoom parameter under the inspector to scale the video to fit or even add more zoom to it and you want to base some of these parameters that you have set to all of the other clips also. The way it works in DaVinci is go to your clip that you want to copy the parameters from, make it active and for copying command plus C and now also choose all of the clips that you want to apply the parameters to. But now instead of command V for general pasting you need to click option plus V this opens up this paste attributes window where you can tick whatever parameter you want to paste to your other clip selections. So in our case, we want zoom. I tick zoom and it automatically also chooses the scales. And now if you also change the position of your clip uh, vertically or horizontally, you can also choose the position and click on apply. And these settings that you've chosen also get applied to other clips. And as a quick extra tip, if you want to duplicate some clip on your timeline, just go ahead and make it active by clicking on it and hold down option key and drag it out, like so. Another small tip to mention is that when you're wanting to expand the timeline and zoom in, it will usually stick to zoom to playhead area. Maybe you don't want that, so you can use a method of zooming to wherever your cursor is. For that, just go to view and click on zoom around mouse pointer. Now we can zoom to wherever our cursor is. <laughs> If during your editing some parts of the edit playback get uh, choppy or slow, in Premiere Pro what you needed to do is create a preview render of some selected part, right? In DaVinci Resolve, one of the options is to use render in place option, which basically creates a file render of your specific select, and then you can view that part normally. Or you could use something called a smart render cache, which can be accessed by going here to playback, going to render cache, and choosing smart. With Smart Render Cache activated, you will start to see this blue line on top of your timeline when you play back your edit. And whenever you play some part of the edit, it starts to create that blue line around your playhead. And this blue line will show you what parts of the edit now you could view smoothly. Although keep in mind that this will start to eat your hard drive space a lot. And at some certain time, you'll need to clean your cache folder when there is no more space left. And to quickly find the location for your cache folder, again, open up project settings by again going to this gear icon over here. Here under the master settings, scroll down until you see working folders. And here you have cache files location. Timeline audio and keyframing. Again, it is very nice to see how interactive the waveform is when you are changing the volume in DaVinci Resolve. Coming from Premiere Pro, maybe by this time they have it also, I don't know. In case you need to quickly keyframe the volume levels to make your sound quieter at some parts, alt click and make a point and then move it according to your needs throughout. It is basically the same way as we keyframed the other clip parameters before. Sometimes whatever extra sound effect you drag onto the timeline, the audio only comes from one ear. That was really confusing to me, but in order to fix that, right click on the audio clip and go to clip attributes. And right here, make this go and make this stereo. And right here in the source channel, from the second drop down, choose embedded channel two and click on okay. And it's in stereo and it's fixed. The color tab. Here are many different tabs for color correcting and making a great. And I believe you will go over time to discover tutorials for many specific things that you would want to achieve. Now, first of all, I want to quickly mention that for all of this, nowadays there are already quite many tutorials about this stuff by actual coloring professionals that you can check out. 
I will also link them in the description that they will definitely explain it more in depth. And for example, over here, like you have the primaries and you have the lock option and switching between those by the looks of it, nothing really seemed to change for the options over here, but this will affect the image differently. So yeah, for this color specific stuff, I would really suggest looking up some specific tutorials by coloring professionals at the base level. And just by experimenting, I believe you can still get already a look that you like without me showing anything. <laughs> but still, I want to mention some key things over here. And that is one of the things that makes DaVinci Resolve stand out from the others. That instead of a layer system for Adobe, for DaVinci, it is a node based system. And that node tree might get really complicated under the Fusion tab, but I will leave that for last. Whoever is interested, so over here in this color tab how it works is the row input starts from the left this here is a node and it immediately starts with a one node and every change we do to the image uh, is stored in this one node obviously what we would want to do is not do every change in one node and basically have the option to toggle each uh, change that we do all the way to the right is the output so let's say with the first node we create a change we do something like that if you want to toggle a specific node just make it active and command plus t lets you toggle it there are also parallel nodes, which are like a combined effect, which basically takes equal amount of each node you have in parallel node, puts it all together and merges it all together. And there's also a layer node is what you would look up when you're wanting to do like skin tone adjustments and want to leave the skin unaffected by your LUT. And talking about LUTs, uh, if you would want to apply a LUT, you can do it by looking it up from up here. Remember in the beginning, we saw where the location for the LUTs is. And if you imported those, you would see them right here. And quickly mentioning the hotkeys, how you can create a new serial node. How you can create a node after your current one is by pressing option plus S. And if you want to quickly add one before your current active node, click shift plus S. Now by default, these are here all adjustments for your specific active clip that you have chosen right here and whatever clip you have active. And you also have the possibility to affect the whole timeline with your changes by coming up above these nodes over here. And by going from this white dot, which is for clip, to the next one, which is for timeline. As you can see, you don't see anything here. So we click option S and this is for global change. And also there are some effects that you can apply for these, for these nodes. Just explore around, have fun with it until you get something that you like. But what I definitely want to go over here is the color space transform. So this is basically the conversion to Rec. 709 already inside the program with many specific parameters already to choose for your specific input color space. So you don't have to have a hassle of browsing around the web for some specific conversion LUT that hopefully would work right. So we can access it from the effects tab and we can drag it onto our node. According to my camera, Sony a 7 IV, I use the Sony S Gamma 3 Cine and input gamma I use s Log 3. So as you can see, there are quite many you can choose right here. Here I just basically set the input and remember our output already can work accordingly because of the project settings we set up earlier in the beginning. So here I just set the input accordingly and quickly going over how you can copy a node create that you have created to other clips. Choose all the clips with command or shift to which you want to apply the create to. Then look for the clip where you have the node create. Right click on the thumbnail and choose apply create. And there you go. Let's say you want to save this node tree grade that you graded. Go to the preview window, right click and choose scrap still. Now if you go under gallery, here you have it and you can drag it onto your clip to apply the saved node tree. Also you have the option to export this exact frame. Next up I also want to quickly mention that, that if you want to make specific mask adjustments to a certain part of the image, specific area adjustments to some object in your frame throughout the video. The tracking in it is insane. It really works well. One of these is the magic mask and it tracks the object really nice. What this will also lead me to show you is at times you want to mask something out, right? And show it on top of your clip. Then according to Premiere, you would want to go back to the edit tab and would want to do the masking somewhere there, right? This is how it works in DaVinci. Under the color tab, we choose window, which lets you choose already specific shapes. Adobe users, you're probably familiar already with the pen tool. Basically, you can create a certain shape for the mask, right? This all gets applied to your active node. And the way it works here in DaVinci, to make this mask cut out as a transparent layer that we could layer in timeline on top of something, right here in the node region, we right click and we click on add alpha output. Under the output screen dot, you will get this blue one. All we need to do is connect this blue square to this blue dot. 
and voila. So now in the editing tab, we can layer this on top of what we want and create some position keyframe into it, whatever. Audio mic presets. So for audio, again, we have a specific workspace. What are the key things in here that I want to show you is how to create a nice audio preset that you could create and you could apply for your specific mic. How to also quickly apply smooth transitions for the audio clips that you wouldn't have to go over one by one and having to manually apply the crossfade transition to your audio clips. Don't have to do that. And with that, how to quickly automatically get the fade in and fade outs uh, applied. And in case some of you are wondering why is that necessary, just to eliminate weird like popping and clipping sounds that might appear and just obviously add continuity to your audio also. And another thing that has to be mentioned here, which I was looking up myself, that how could I keyframe and automate the EQ to at times create like those low pass or high pass effects. So that is also done in here. Uh, so let's get right into it. First of all, how to create an audio preset. Firstly, make sure on what audio track do you have your microphone voice track, in this case A1. So let's start adding some effects to it. To the right, we have the mixer where you can add all the effects to your track. First, let's quickly add some EQ. If you click on this once, you disable the EQ, but if you double click on it, you can modify the EQ. Next up for additional effects, you can click this plus icon and look for effects for vocals like maybe vocal channel and from the Dynamics multiband compressor and limiter maybe. Once you have set it up like so that it sounds nice with your specific microphone, go to top menu and choose Fairlight, then choose Presets Library. Here you can save your presets and apply them. If you want to save everything you set up in your mixer and not just equalizer setting but effects also, go and choose here Global Track Presets. This will also save the effects. Now choose the audio track which you want to save as a preset and click save new and then you can name the preset. To apply it to some audio track, choose the preset from the left and audio track from the right to where you want to apply it and click on apply. Now I want to mention how you can quickly apply some crossfade transitions for your audio clips and also add fade ins and fade outs for these starting and ending clips. Select all the clips you want to apply the transitions to, then again go to Fairlight option, then click on Patch Fade Settings. As you can see from here, it is really simple. Pick here what you want to apply and click on Apply and it is done. Now let's quickly go over automating some audio effects. In this case, just EQ to over time get this low pass or high pass effect. Click this icon here to toggle on automations. Next up from this icon to the right of it, we get this extra bar here on top. What we want to achieve here is that we could simply record the automation by moving these EQ buttons over here. On the bar here, set this one to latch. That means it's going to start recording only the buttons we move. And the next one, let's set it to hold instead of return. So, so once when we are done automating, the button we moved would not go back to the position we started moving it from and recording it from, but instead would we'll stay at the level where we ended the recording. Next up from the enables, choose what you want to automate. In this case, we want EQ. And now we are able to playback and automate over time. Once you are done, in order to see what we changed over time, go to this drop down over here, choose EQ. And here we are able to see the line over time. And actually you could change these parameters and automate here too by adding points like we did before in the editing tab. And I think that it's it for the audio tab. And now we are finally getting to the fusion tab which is under this magic wand over here. It is basically DaVinci Resolve's version of After Effects. Now remember in the whole Adobe package uh, After Effects is a separate program. But here we already have it inside our editing suite, a big W. What also comes out here is that instead of a layer based system for After Effects, you'll see that everything in here is using these blocks which are connected by wires. <laughs> this is again a node based system which we also saw already in our color tab. And here I want to go over some of the main effects that I was using heavily After Effects for and was in a little bit of a pickle in DaVinci Resolve which was 3D camera movement in general, motion tracking and also in After Effects terms the wiggle expression for shaking some layer, also creating camera movements like whips and zooms with motion blur. So let's get started. Now down below here in the notes section as in color tab to the left we have our input and to the very right our output. So we would want to add some magic sauce in between, right? <laughs> to be able to create something. So how we can add something and how it works here in Fusion is by pressing together Shift plus Spacebar. 
and this opens up the select tool where you can quickly search for some effect that you can add. First let's start with something we already did under the editing tab which is the text pop-in zoom effect. So we will look for transform and this can be used to make those camera movements that I was talking about. These motion blurry whip transitions, zoom in transitions, whatever you want to create. So once we click on add, once that node is also active under our node section that we added, you will see the parameters for it right here to the right. And this line over here right in the middle uh, represents the timeline. Now to the right again, as you remember from the editing tab and under the inspector tab, we had the possibilities for creating uh, keyframes, uh, which also works the same right here. You have these uh, squares, so let's do that. And let's just make a zoom in pop in again. So right here on the timeline, I go to wherever I want to end the pop in and, and set a keyframe for it. And now I go all the way to the beginning and put the zoom to zero. And now if we play it back, it pops in. And now after you've done all the keyframe adjustments, as a last thing, you would want to add some motion blur. Once you're ready with everything, because it's also a pretty taxing effect on your computer. The way you can usually find motion blur in Fusion is under many different effects you choose, you have this settings tab right here. And right here you have the motion blur option. Click on it. And the default quality of two doesn't look so good. So I crank this up to 10, so the maximum value. And voila, now we have motion blur. Now, before I will show you the next effect we add, I want to also go over how the keyframe manipulation works here in the Fusion tab and how to make those smooth ease in S-curves and how to edit the curve yourself, like in After Effects. So right here on top, firstly, we go under the keyframes and right here for every node, we have our keyframe points that you can see. So I click this button over here, which is uh, zoom to fit. This just helps you better navigate in here. And let's just say for every keyframe, you want to quickly add some smooth curves, which is actually really useful for 360 footage. <laughs> because for 360 cameras, I use a lot of movements. Uh, and generally for that camera, you want all of the movements to be smooth. So I click and drag here to select every keyframe I have. And now what I need to just do is click F on my keyboard. And as you can see, it created this S curve for everything. So this quick method over here has oftentimes come really handy for me with my 360 footage. So the camera movement for it. So it's just quickly creating smooth camera movements for it. And as for the specific curve adjustments, you need to go to the left of the keyframes, which is called spline and choose right here, which parameter curve you want to see. And again, this zoom to fit button comes really handy. So you can quickly see the curve and by clicking on in or out point, you will see the handles, which you can drag, uh, which you can drag to your liking. And this is how you can really dial in the curve according to your liking. Next up, I want to show you the Minty Resolves equivalent to After Effects uh, wiggle expression. The terminology for these things inside of DaVinci will differ, so you just have to find the right thing that you're looking for. But in this case, to make this text wiggle, we go again Shift plus Space, and in DaVinci I will look for Camera Shake. Click on Add and boom! And you will see that in the Notes section this was, this was added as the next note. And now we can also combine this newly added effect with the transform. So for this camera shake effect, we can maybe just uh, we can maybe just keyframe the intensity for it. So it comes in really shaky, and then it then it cools down. Now I want to go over some basic motion tracking. So let's just track some text into our scene. So here we have our clip node, and again shift plus space. We will look for planar tracker, add, and in this example, let's just track some text into our scene. Or with having the planar tracker active, and right here in the preview window of the clip, we want to choose the area that we want to track, like so. It's really quickly going over it. Operation mode, we have it as track, and for some text tracking, this is how we leave it as. But options like corner pin, for example, would allow you to track like posters or something, where we would like set the exact corners like for a poster or, or a TV. And stabilize option is something you could use for like the for like these commercials where you have like the earbud track to the middle always. But we will use track. Then we need to set the reference time for the plugin. So wherever you are in the timeline, click set. Motion type, let's leave it as so. 
The next ones I'm gonna leave like so, but motion type is where you just see yourself, what type of footage do you have, and what does your scene really do? Do you even have some perspective change or rotation and scale uh, changes? So I'm gonna leave it as so. So as the next thing, we have the options to track to start over here and track to end. So I go over both of these so we can have the whole scene tracked. And as you can see, once it's done, we click on create planar transform. So in our notes section, we get this planar transform node uh, separately. And now what we want to do, let's not forget our text that we want to add. Click on this T over here. We get our text. So let's say test. And let's go to our main pipeline over here that runs. I will look for merge. And this is a note that lets you do exactly what it says. It allows you to take in multiple inputs and merge them together and send them out as one output. We had merged to the main pipeline and what we'll need to do right now is feed in this text to planar transforms. And to planar transform, I connect this to merge and voila, we have it tracked. From After Effects days, it was really nice to do some 3D camera animation movements with camera and the layers. I'm going to show you how to do something similar in Fusion. In the editing tab, I will add some pictures. I click and drag and choose all of those. Right click and choose new Fusion clip. We got some extra merge stuff over here. I delete those. So the media ins over here are our pictures or the clips. Now, in order to break these connected wires, you just double click on them. So to set this thing all up, uh, camera animations. What you need to do is for every media in, you need to add to it uh, image plane 3D. Like so. And now again, combining all this stuff together, we need to merge. But now instead of the usual merge, we will look for merge 3D. Next up, we want to add camera 3D. And the next thing we want is render 3D, add. And to see the whole 3D perspective and where the camera is and the image planes, under this merge 3D node, we have this circle options. Uh, so if you choose one of them, it, it will show the merge 3D in this left or right window. I choose the left circle. And so here you can see, if you want to change some image position, you go to image plane 3D and move it around. For the camera movements, you come to camera 3D and you have all of these options right here. So you come under transform and here again, you can set the keyframes for camera animation, for camera movements and boom. <laughs> From more fun stuff that you can look into yourself is a cool thing that you can also add in here which is a surface tracker so you can have your element mimic the surface you've chosen in your in your scene like the tutorial examples are how you can add a logo to your shirt and it actually does a really great job now once all of your edit is done and you want to render it out we'll need to go to the delivery tab which is this rocket icon over here and firstly, make sure that you have the in and out points for the edit on the timeline rightly set. So if there is some random clip somewhere far away on the timeline, it wouldn't go to render like a one hour video because of that. Next up, I'll just quickly go over some settings that I use and feel free to test your own ones for quality. Over here, we want a single clip, but you will also have an option to let out individual clips as a batch. And before, resolution frame rate already good. And for YouTube 4K upload, can go from like 50k to 80k even. I just put it to 60k and I click on add to render queue. This appears here on the right side. And this here is basically something again that Adobe has separately under media encoder, a separate program again, where you can add renders to queue. And the final thing we need to do to get the render going is click this button over here. Wait for it to render, it actually goes really quickly. <laughs> and yeah, so I hope you got something out of this. Obviously hard to cover everything, so use the comment section down below. And yeah, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, like the video, it would help a lot. And as always, I see you soon. Peace.